Upon being asked, how come there are so many Arahants in Thailand and in Thai Buddhist history, but that since the coming of the Buddha, we do not have any record of any Arahants anywhere else? I would like to say that, well, according to legend or the Buddhist prophecies, after the last Arahant of the last enlightened being, who was the Buddha Sakyamuni, uh, we're not really supposed to have any more Arahants at all until the coming of Maitreya, who is the last Buddha of this era. And so in that sense, we should probably think, well, perhaps all of the supposed Thai Arahants are mistaken claims, if the legend is to be believed. I personally don't believe in legends, except that they are founded in truth, but that they are distorted. And so uh, I don't place my faith or my life in gambling on legends. I personally don't think that time periods are what prevent people from becoming arahants either. And so I don't think there is anything preventing any of us from trying hard enough to become an arahant before the next coming, according to the legend. I actually believe that there are people who become arahants, but who perhaps don't let anybody ever know about it. And I believe there have been many arahants since the passing of the Buddha, but that it has gone unknown to public society. As to the many publicly accepted arahants in the present day and era or in recent history, I believe that a lot of those have been named or sanctified by people who do not know what an arahant is. And so um, people want to believe that the master of their own country is an arahant or is the greatest, the same as we do with our sports heroes or our rock stars or whatever our, our uh, Olymp Olympians, Olymp Olympian sportsmen. We all want our country to win. And so I believe that nationalism and nationalistic pride is one of the reasons that monks get easily raised in status to the status of sanctified arahant by the people. It's the people who do it. And most people are very, not very well educated as to the full Buddha Dhamma and as to the different stages of enlightenment and the mood and mind of people who have attained those stages. And so if you don't know the mood, mind and behavior and speech of an arahant, how can you start calling somebody an arahant? And so I would say one should not get tangled up with all of these kind of paranoid questions and should just try to become an arahant oneself and try to learn what it means to be an arahant because before you could ever strive to attain arahantship, you would have to understand what it means to attain arahantship in order to want it. If not, then it would be pointless. And so I think uh, we shouldn't really place our faith or rely on legends and wait for other beings to become enlightened. Rather, we should just get on with our own work and try and reduce our suffering and reach the cessation of suffering and the attainment of arahantship. And don't worry about all those stories and legends because it's not going to help you advance yourself and reach the goal yourself to the far shore of arahantship and nibbana. And so we don't need to know what's happening outside ourselves or who's coming in the future or if there is any are any other people who are doing well or have enlightened now, it's not going to enlighten you or me. And so everybody has to focus on themselves and get down with their own business and get the job done and stop worrying about what's happening with everybody else. And so that's about what I have to say about this. The fact that uh, between the coming of the last Buddha and the next Buddha, in Thailand, we have many stories of supposed arahants. I don't think it's worth wondering. You cannot know if another person has attained arahantship or not. And arahantship is an imaginary state. 
which represents a real thing. And so I believe once you become an arahant, you stop believing in the concept of arahantship. You just change, but you don't become something. It's all imaginary. The arahant is a, a category for communication reasons, and it's used by unenlightened people. But actually, there's no space between Sotapanna, Sagitakami, Anakami and Arahant. They're just different stages. But they're they're not clear cut. You know, you could cut cut eight categories instead of four and or sixteen or thirty two. And everybody would be leaving then in thirty two different kinds of enlightened being. They're just lines on a map and you can move them around. It's just for communication purposes to understand the concept. The reality of it is not conditioned and does not fit into any category at all. And so as soon as you've attained it, such categorizations become meaningless. And so I hope uh, if you have any doubts about these matters that this little talk has uh, cleared some of it up for you and that you can get on with your practice without worrying about what's happening around and outside of you. You cannot know, no point in wondering about it. Just find out for yourself. And that's what the Buddha taught us. Don't believe me. Try it out, experience yourself, and find out for yourself. This is Ajahn Spencer, once again, signing off, wishing you well. Good night.